But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the remembrance of your name to all generations. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. In his book, Concise Theology, A Guide to Historic Christian Beliefs, J.I. Packer discusses the significance of names. In the modern world, a person's name is merely an identifying label, like a number which could be changed without loss. Bible names, however, have their background in the widespread tradition that personal names give information, describing in some way who people are. A classic example of this is the name Abram, which means exalted father. However, Abraham means father of a multitude. This is in perfect keeping with Genesis 17:5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Greg Williamson compiled a list of verses which show that in nearly a dozen different ways the Old Testament affirms that the divine name of God is the greatest name of all. In fact, scripture teaches that the divine name endures forever, is awesome, is beyond human understanding, it is exalted and glorious, it is good, it is great, it is holy and jealously preserved, it is majestic and trustworthy. Again, in his book Concise Theology, A Guide to Historic Christian Beliefs, J.I. Packer writes regarding the name of the Lord. The Old Testament constantly celebrates the fact that God has made his name known to Israel, and the Psalms direct praise to God's name over and over. Name here means God himself as he has revealed himself by word and deed. At the heart of this self-revelation is the name by which he authorized Israel to invoke him. God declared this name to Moses when he spoke to him out of the thorn bush that burned steadily without being burned up. The name in all its forms proclaims his eternal, self-sustaining, self-determining, sovereign reality, that supernatural mode of existence that the sign of the burning bush had signified. The bush, we might say, was God's three-dimensional illustration of his own inexhaustible life. This is my name forever, he said, that is, God's people should always think of him as the living, reigning, potent, unfettered, and undiminished king that the burning bush showed him to be. Psalm 148.13 reads, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Psalm 96.2 Sing to the Lord, bless his name, Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. And indeed, we do sing praises to our Heavenly Father, just as the Psalms instruct. However, it is curious that many of these songs do not directly bless his name. Rather, they seem to simply acknowledge that he has a name instead of actually proclaiming his name. Consider, for example, when we sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. When you pause to think about these lyrics, they inevitably lead to one question. What is the actual name of the Most High God? We seem to most commonly refer to him as the Lord, but really this is a title that identifies a role of authority, which is why he often is referred to as the Lord of Lords. And since we do place ourselves under his divine authority, it is certainly acceptable to address him as the Lord, but it's equally important to recognize that this is not his authentic, proper name. This is an important fact to understand because learning someone's name is often the very first step in developing any kind of friendship or relationship. And since we identify as children of God and He is our Heavenly Father, it only stands to reason that we should be able to call Him by name. This is particularly convicting given the fact that we are often required to learn the names of countless Greek gods as part of our state-mandated education. So what is the actual name of the Most High God? 
This video will investigate this question by carefully studying several key scriptures and analyzing the original Hebrew and Greek context to see what can be learned regarding the name of our Heavenly Father. For those unfamiliar with it, the website Blue Letter Bible is a tremendous resource with a variety of easy to navigate study tools and a wealth of scriptural information. Blue Letter Bible also has an app available on all smartphones. There are a number of other reputable Bible apps that offer the same resources and can help facilitate a deeper study of the Word of God. This video will be using screenshots from Blue Letter Bible to help demonstrate how to utilize these options. But regardless of the resource being used, the interlinear button will open the Strong's Concordance, which provides the original Hebrew and Greek meanings of any word, as well as a lexicon of other information that can provide context and understanding for any scripture verse. Isaiah 42.8 seems an appropriate place to begin this study. Here the Father very plainly states, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. This appears to be a fairly definitive statement. The Father very clearly declares his name is the Lord. It must be noted, however, that the word LORD is written in all caps, which does differentiate it from the other words in the verse. Could this perhaps be a clue that there is more going on in this verse? After searching this verse out on Blue Letter Bible, clicking the Tools button will open the available study resources and will also display the original Hebrew words behind the English translation. Displayed here is the Strong's Concordance number associated with the Hebrew word that was translated into the phrase, I am the Lord. Clicking on this number will open another window with an abundance of information specific to this particular word. This window shows the original word written in modern Hebrew, a phonetic pronunciation, as well as a short audio file to hear the word Yehovah being spoken. Scrolling down, you'll find the outline of biblical usage, which reveals that Jehovah equals the existing one. Amazingly, it also identifies this as the proper name of the one true God. This is an exciting revelation because, as mentioned earlier, the word Lord is a title and not a proper name. So this becomes clear evidence that the Father does indeed have an actual proper name. However, his name has been tragically substituted out of nearly all modern Bible translations. When the word Lord is written in all caps or in small caps, it denotes a substitution for this same Hebrew word, which is the proper name of the Most High God. This substitution is found an astounding 6,510 times in the text of the Old Testament. The same is true for God written in all caps. This substitution is found 304 times in the text of the Old Testament. Examples of this name in its original context can still be found in countless Torah scrolls across the world. This validates that the authentic, proper name of the Father did in fact appear in the earliest versions of the scriptures. This Hebrew name is often referred to as the Tetragrammaton, which is a Greek word meaning four letters. When examining this word, it is first important to note that Hebrew reads right to left. The names of the individual Hebrew characters are Yod, He, Wa, also known as Vav, followed by another He. When these characters have their basic sounds matched to the equivalent English letters, it renders the results YHWH. Transposing these letters to account for English reading right to left creates an English transliteration of the proper name of the Most High God. This is the name that gets substituted as Lord in all capitals. It is also worth noting that the third character in the name is understood by some scholars as having a V sound. Thus, some transliterations will render the name as YHVH. This fact is clearly detailed in the explanatory notes of several Bible versions. For example, the KJV explains, the covenant name of God in the Old Testament, represented by the Hebrew consonants YHWH, is translated Lord or God, using capital letters as shown, as it has been throughout the history of the King James Bible. The question then becomes, if the name of the Most High God appears in early copies of the Hebrew Scriptures, why is it now routinely substituted out of modern translations? The following brief explanation should provide enough context to understand how this tradition of substituting the name began. 
After the reign of King Solomon, the nation of Israel was divided into two separate kingdoms. The southern kingdom of Judah was composed of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and was under the rule of King Rehoboam. The northern kingdom of Israel was comprised of the other ten tribes under the authority of Jeroboam. These historical events are detailed in the twelfth chapter of 1 Kings. After decades of disobedience, rebellion, and fierce warnings from numerous prophets, Jerusalem was besieged and ultimately defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, and the kingdom of Judah was led away into exile. These historic events are detailed in 2 Kings chapter 24. After returning from their time in exile, as the kingdom of Judah began to rebuild, they slowly began to develop a series of traditions to prevent themselves from even coming close to breaking any of the commandments given at Mount Sinai. These secondary rules, which eventually became known as the Halakha, were designed out of a desire to be as obedient as possible, and thus never require such a harsh punishment. Included among these new traditions was not speaking aloud the name of God. As a result, after several generations, the exact pronunciation of the name was lost. This tradition of not speaking the name also eventually resulted in the development of a written rule among scribes to help prevent people from saying the Father's name while reading scripture aloud. This invented word was a visual reminder for people not to pronounce the divine name and to speak instead the word Adonai. Essentially, scribes began to combine the consonants from the divine name with the vowels from the word Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. This contrived word was never meant to be pronounced, but was instead a visual reminder to say Adonai. Early Christian scribes eventually began to pronounce this name as Yehovah, not realizing this was a hybrid word. Many scholars believe that sometime in the 16th century, a German Christian scribe, while translating the Bible into Latin for the Pope, wrote this invented name out as it appeared in his texts. Because J is pronounced Y in German, the word Yehovah was written as Jehovah. It is worth noting, however, that the Hebrew language does not actually have any letters which produce a traditional English J sound. Because of all this confusion, and the uncertainty about how exactly to pronounce the name, many modern Bible translations began the practice of simply substituting the divine name with the word Lord. Using the word Lord made sense given the fact that Jewish scribes had created the hybrid word as a visual reminder to say Adonai, which means Lord. The ESV Bible confirms this in an explanatory note. When the vowels of the word Adonai are placed with the consonants of yod heh wah -Heh, this results in the familiar word Jehovah that was used in some earlier English Bible translations. As is common among English translations today, the ESV usually renders the personal name of God by the word Lord printed in small capitals. With a little investigation, Blue Letter Bible can also be used to confirm these claims. Returning first to Strong's H3068, which is documented as the proper name of the one true God, the outline of biblical usage section also reveals the following fact, unpronounced except with the vowel pointings of 0136. So this word, the proper name of God, was not pronounced unless it had the vowels from another Hebrew word numbered as 0136. By scrolling down a little further, an embedded search tool allows for words to be found by their Strong's Concordance number. Entering 0136 and clicking search will find this word. Not surprisingly, Strong's H136 is the Hebrew word Adonai. The outline of biblical usage for this word reveals that the primary meaning of this word is in fact Lord. Even more interesting though is the additional usage outlined as Lord, title, spoken in place of Yahweh in Jewish display of reverence. So here is scriptural evidence demonstrating that the proper name of the one true God was not spoken except when combined with the vowels of the Hebrew word Adonai, and in such cases Adonai, or Lord, was spoken in place of the divine name. 
There is another clue to the father's name found in a verse from the book of Exodus. Chapter 6, verse 3 reads, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. It is fascinating that this one single verse, for whatever reason, does not substitute the divine name with the word Lord. The interlinear for this verse reveals that it is, once again, Strong's H3068, which is listed as the proper name of the one true God. The pronunciation key shows the transliteration as Yehovah, but then the word is rendered in the KJV and a few other Bible versions as Jehovah. It has already been explained how the Y and J sounds in these words have been replaced, but it still inevitably leads to the question, if our Heavenly Father does have an actual name, how is it pronounced? Before addressing the pronunciation of the divine name, it is important to first remember the instructions of our Messiah in Matthew 18 regarding our attitude and demeanor. Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It is imperative that this topic be approached with an abundance of humility and with the meekness of a child. When a father hears his young child's first attempts at saying his name, he is not concerned in the slightest if the child is pronouncing it exactly right. Instead, his heart is filled with immeasurable joy at the sound of his child's voice acknowledging his name. Surely our Heavenly Father feels the same way about his children. Given the history of the divine name, it must simply be acknowledged that the correct pronunciation has tragically been lost. There are numerous scholars who claim to be critically convinced they have discovered how to properly enunciate the name, and yet each one proclaims a different name. This fact alone seems to indicate that the correct name simply cannot be known until Christ returns. Unfortunately, there are even those that go so far as to suggest that if you don't say the name correctly, your prayers won't be answered and your salvation might even be in jeopardy. This is a dangerous theological position because it reduces our Father's name to a magic word which only has power when spoken properly. And since the Most High knew the pronunciation of his name would be lost, it would seem cruel and petty that he would refuse someone's salvation over simply mispronouncing his name. This idea has no valid scriptural support and also goes against a foundational truth about the Father's character in that we know he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This thinking is also dangerous because it very often produces a prideful, argumentative, and unfruitful spirit in people who then become quick to chastise and condemn fellow believers. But we must never forget that we are to sanctify the Lord in our hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When deciding on how to pronounce the name of the Lord, it must be acknowledged that we are all doing our best with four consonants. So it comes as no surprise that there are a variety of pronunciations. There are still those that favor the traditional Jehovah or Yehovah. Yahweh is perhaps the most common pronunciation. Recently, however, many have come to prefer Yahuwah, while still others may say Yahuwah. Ultimately, what is most important is that our Father has an actual name, and He encourages us to use it. This is a thrilling revelation that we can personally engage with our Father by name, just as the scriptures repeatedly suggest. One way to begin immediately celebrating and using Yahweh's name is to restore it in scripture reading. In much the same way that the Hebrew scribes used their hybrid word to prevent people from speaking the Father's name, many believers now use the Lord in all capitals as a visual reminder to speak Yahweh's name when reading the text. Thus, returning to Isaiah 42.8, it can now be read, I am Yahweh, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Reinstating Yahweh's name back into the scripture helps one truly recognize the astonishing number of times it has been removed, but it also will provide valuable context that might have been otherwise missed. For example, 
Then they that feared Yahweh spake often to one another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. When reading this verse in other Bible versions, the word that gets translated as thought is also rendered as meditate, honored, or esteemed. Clearly the father is concerned with what his children think about his name, and truly there is much scriptural treasure to be discovered within the name itself. Another fascinating variant of Yahweh's name can be found in one single verse in the King James Version, Psalm 64, 8. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that writeth upon the heavens by his name Jah, and rejoice before him. When examining the interlinear for this verse, it is discovered that the Hebrew word Jah is actually Yah. It's worth noting that the two Hebrew letters in the word Yah, Yod and He, are also the first two letters in Yahweh's name. The Strong's concordance number for this word is 3050, and when it is opened up, the outline of biblical usage reveals that Jah is Jehovah in the shortened form, and that this abbreviated name is still the proper name of the one true God. It is amazing to learn that while this word appears 49 times in the Old Testament, it is only translated as Jah this one time. In the other 48 instances, it is again translated as Lord in all capitals. For example, in Psalm 147.1, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. There is an exciting connection to be made by opening the interlinear for this verse and looking at the first line, Praise the Lord. Here again, the word translated Lord is Strong's 3050, Yah, the shortened form of the proper name of our Heavenly Father. The word translated as praise is Strong's 1984, the Hebrew Halal. These two words together are what derive the common exclamation of praise, Hallelujah, which actually appears four times in the book of Revelation. The truly amazing part about this word, which literally means praise the Lord, is that you are actually calling him by name when you use it. For many, it is an extremely powerful experience to discover that the Father has an actual name, and yet it can be very overwhelming grappling with all the various pronunciations, especially when Hebrew is not their native language. Out of a deep respect and reverence for the name, many can feel strongly that they don't want to say it incorrectly. Thankfully, he has provided this beautifully simple variation of his name that anyone should be able to speak with confidence. In fact, many choose to replace the word God in their regular conversations with the shortened form Yah. Thus, it seems that this shortened form of the Father's name is another astonishing act of grace on his part. Respect for Yahweh's name is extremely important. As mentioned earlier, it was actually because of their fear of the Lord that the early Israelites began to not speak Yahweh's name. This led to a tradition, still in common practice today, of addressing the Father as Hashem, which simply means the name. This custom came from an extremely strong conviction to not take the Lord's name in vain. We see this command in Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So what exactly does it mean to take Yah's name in vain? Using the interlinear tool to examine the various meanings of the original Hebrew words can often help provide a more rich understanding for difficult verses. For example, the word take can also mean to lift, bear up, carry, or take, while the word translated as vain can also mean emptiness, nothingness, vanity, or worthlessness. Thus, a fuller understanding might be that we should not lift up and carry his name in a way that makes it empty or worthless. The Bible also frequently refers to this as profaning Yahweh's name. In essence, profaning the name is to claim to live under the authority of Yahweh and then act in a manner that is hypocritical to his word and character, thus bringing dishonor and shame to the sanctity of his name. Scripture actually has several examples of behaviors that are specifically mentioned as actions that would profane the name of Yahweh. These include blaspheming or cursing the name of Yahweh, swearing falsely by the name of Yahweh, 
touching holy things dedicated to Yahweh, stealing, sharing false visions and prophecies, idol worship, a father and his son having intercourse with the same woman, and sacrificing children to Molech. It must be noted that simply speaking Yahweh's name is not included in this list. In fact, there is a very significant point regarding this issue that can be gleaned from the experience of Moses when he was on the mountain and asked to see Yahweh's glory. In contrast to profaning the name, we see the power inherent in proclaiming the name. Yahweh placed Moses in the cleft of the rock, covered him with his hand, and said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. Then in the next chapter, Yahweh instructs Moses to cut two tablets of stone and return to the top of Mount Sinai. Now Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Both these situations reveal the awesome wonder associated with the name. When revealing his goodness and when inviting Moses into his very presence, Yahweh proclaimed his own name. Author Kevin DeYoung summarizes this beautifully. The way to see God's glory is to hear his name. To know the name Yahweh, the merciful and gracious one, is not to merely know something about God, it is to know God himself. Considering this example, and considering the great number of verses which instruct us to honor and remember his name, it seems obvious that we need not be ashamed to proudly speak the name of Yahweh with reverence and humility. There is one more remarkable truth that is important to share regarding the meaning behind the name of Yahweh. Uncovering this truth requires first learning a few more brief points about Hebrew, which is an absolutely fascinating language filled with a great deal of depth and significance. Many have spent a lifetime of studying the nuances of Hebrew and are still discovering new scriptural insights and connections. In order to see the meaning embedded in Yahweh's name, it must first be traced back to the earlier forms of written Hebrew. A historical example of one of the early forms of Hebrew writing is found on the Moabite stone, known also as the Misha steel, which is believed to be from 840 BC. It is currently the oldest known extra-biblical inscription of the Tetragrammaton. The writing in the stone details the accomplishments of the Moabite king Misha. It also gives a contrary account of the events described in 2 Kings 3 and specifically mentions Yahweh by name in the 18th line of text. The text reads, And I took thence the vessels of Yahweh, and I dragged them before Shamash. Even when it is giving a false account of history, there is something truly fascinating about seeing the name of Yahweh, the Most High God, inscribed in a 3,000-year-old stone. The earliest versions of Hebrew were primarily pictographic in nature, with each character having a numeric value as well as several key meanings connected to that letter. In this way, individual words can have powerful symbolic content based on the meanings associated with each individual letter. This chart examines the three Hebrew characters used to spell our father's name, Yod, He, Wa, He. The chart catalogs the three most commonly referenced versions of Hebrew writing and attempts to show the visual progression from the early pictographic form of writing to the modern form used today. Also included are the various meanings associated with each of the individual letters, as well as their numeric value. When examining the meanings of each individual letter in Yahweh's name, a startling revelation becomes apparent. The yod can mean a hand or a finished work or deed. The he conveys showing or revealing something, to behold. The wa most commonly denotes a nail, and again the he can mean behold. Thus, when we combine these separate definitions, we get a combined meaning of behold a hand, behold a nail. How extraordinary that the name our Father would choose for himself would have hidden within it his plan of redemption through the sacrificial death of the Messiah. Behold a hand, behold a nail. Hallelujah indeed. 
And since this video is exploring the Hebraic origins behind the name of the Lord, it would seem entirely appropriate to also investigate the name Jesus and explore what insights might be gained regarding our Messiah. The first appearance of the name Jesus appears in Matthew 121, And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Before exploring the interlinear behind the name Jesus, it would first be worth addressing a common question regarding our Savior. Why was his name not Emmanuel? A clue is found by continuing on in Matthew 1, verses 22 and 23. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. The highlighted portion of this verse is a direct quote from Isaiah 7.14. So if Isaiah prophesied this regarding the Messiah, why did Mary and Joseph name their son Jesus? In an article on the Apologetics Press website, Eric Lyon writes, To better understand what Isaiah meant by the name Emmanuel, it is helpful to consider what the prophet wrote two chapters later. In further prophesying about the Messiah, Isaiah wrote, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His, the Messiah's, attributes shall be such as to make all these applications appropriate descriptions of his power and work. To be called, and to be, in the Hebrew, often mean the same thing. Such a use of a verb is not uncommon in Isaiah. One calls him is, according to the usage in Isaiah, the equivalent of saying he will justly bear this name, more simply, he will be. Thus, these names were given to describe the nature of the Messiah, not serve as literal given names. In the same way, by nature the Son of Mary was Emmanuel, God with us, but by name he was Jesus. Lyon goes on to write, A similar distinction between one's nature and name is found as early as Genesis chapter 2. Following God's creation of Eve from Adam's rib, the first man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Although Adam said she shall be called woman, one chapter later Moses recorded how Adam called his wife's name Eve. Obviously, Adam meant that by nature the one whom God created from his rib was a female human, a helper comparable to him, but by name she would be known as Eve. So when returning to Matthew 121 and looking at the interlinear behind the name Jesus, we find it is Strong's G2424. There is much to discover by clicking on this resource link. Here is the name Jesus as it originally appeared in the Greek and would have been pronounced Iesus. It is fascinating to note in the outline of biblical usage, the very first listing is Jesus equals Jehovah is salvation. It is immediately incredible to realize that the name Yahweh includes a reference to the salvation of Messiah, and likewise the Messiah's name includes a reference to the salvation of Jehovah or Yahweh. Because there are several other people named Jesus in the Bible, it also confirms that this name is primarily attributed to the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, God incarnate. However, interestingly, this name, Iesus, is also connected with Joshua, the famous captain of the Israelites, Moses' successor. In fact, there is an intriguing connection to be made with Joshua when examining the Hebrew origin of his name, Strong's 3091. The original Hebrew, which is the root word behind the etymology of Jesus, is pronounced Yehoshua. And looking at the outline of biblical usage, it is incredible to see it is Joshua or Jehoshua equals Jehovah is salvation. The exact same definition for the name Jesus. It also confirms that the primary person associated with this name was the son of Nun of the tribe of Ephraim and successor to Moses as the leader of the children of Israel, led the conquest of Canaan. This confirms the fact that there is a direct connection between the name Jesus and the name Joshua. 
This point can be further validated by looking at the Hebrew word behind any Old Testament verse that specifically makes mention of Joshua, the son of Nun. The interlinear reveals that it is, in fact, Strong's H3091, the same exact word, Yehoshua. When looking at this name in Hebrew, it is possible to actually see how Yehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. The etymology behind this name actually has two root words, the first being Strong's H3068, which is the exact same word that was discussed earlier in this video as the proper name of the one true God. The second root word behind Yehoshua is Strong's H3467, among whose definitions include save, savior, deliver, help, preserved, salvation, and more. So quite literally, these two words combine to mean Yahweh is salvation. So there is an undeniable link between the name Joshua in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament, since both equal Jehovah is salvation. There are also New Testament verses that further underscore the connection between these two names. In Acts chapter 7 it reads, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. It is important to first note that this verse must be talking about Joshua, the son of Nun, because the context of the previous verse, which mentions the tabernacle in the wilderness and Moses, demands that it be Joshua. And to be sure, nearly every modern Bible version translates this word as Joshua, except for the King James Version, which actually translates it as Jesus. Why would the KJV translators make this curious decision when, as mentioned, the context of the passage seems to obviously require that this is Joshua, not Jesus, being spoken about? Perhaps it is because Joshua and Jesus have the same name. When looking at the interlinear behind Acts 7.45, it shows Strong's G2424, the exact same Greek word used in every instance for the name Jesus. The same situation happens in Hebrews 4, verse 8. Nearly every modern Bible version translates Strong's G2424 as Joshua, although the King James Version renders it as Jesus. Again, this is a curious choice given the context of the passage. Uncovering this context, however, does require a bit more investigation. Hebrews 4.8 mentions that Joshua, or Jesus, had given them rest. In fact, the first six verses of chapter 4 also repeatedly use the words them, they, and those in reference to a seemingly unknown group of people. Identifying these people being mentioned will make it clear whether it is Jesus or Joshua being referred to in verse 8. It is first worth noting that Psalms 95.1 is quoted twice in this passage. Psalms 95, 8-11 directly references the Israelites' rebellion and their 40 years in the wilderness. Further insight can be gained by reading the final verses in Hebrews chapter 3, which immediately precede this opening passage of chapter 4. These verses provide clear context of who these people are, and thus make it clear that it is Joshua being mentioned in Hebrews 4, 8. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So to review, the Old Testament contains the Hebrew word Yehoshua, which is translated into Joshua, and the New Testament contains the Greek word Iesus, which is translated into both Jesus and Joshua, and all three of these names are listed as meaning Jehovah is salvation. These facts alone make it seem very apparent that Jesus and Joshua likely had the same name. There is, however, one more isolated verse that is worth investigating. 
Nehemiah 8.17, And all the congregation of them that were coming again out of the captivity made booths, and sat under the booths, for since the days of Jeshua the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. This indeed is a peculiar verse since it records that this is still the son of Nun, and yet it lists his name as Jeshua instead of Joshua. Interestingly enough, the entry for Joshua on etymology.com states that it is the masculine proper name for the biblical successor of Moses as leader of the Israelites. From late Latin Jeshua, Joshua, a transliteration of Hebrew Yehoshua, literally, the Lord is salvation. The interlinear behind the name Jeshua is Strong's H3442. Unpacking this word provides further confirmation that it is the same Joshua being mentioned in this isolated verse. It is first interesting to note that Jeshua equals he is saved, and that the primary person this name is associated with is the son of Nun of the tribe of Ephraim and successor to Moses as the leader of the children of Israel. Also, the root for this word is Strong's H3091, which is the Hebrew name Yehoshua that is always translated as Joshua. It is also relevant to take notice of this name as it appears in Hebrew and the pronunciation Yeshua. This is yet another example from a list of over 200 names in the Bible where a Hebrew word beginning with a Y sound ends up getting transliterated with a J as the first letter in the English spelling. Because of this, there is one last Hebrew word with a very similar pronunciation and meaning that would also be appropriate to explore here. Strong's H3434, whose original Hebrew spelling appears here, is pronounced almost exactly the same, Yeshua. Interestingly, the root for this word is the same as one of the two roots from Joshua, and whose meaning includes save, savior, deliverer, help, preserved, salvation, and more. The KJV translation count supports this as it is translated as salvation 65 times. It also carries the connotation of salvation by God. This word, Yeshua, is perhaps the most commonly cited pronunciation of Jesus' original Hebrew name used today by numerous ministries and Bible scholars. When comparing these three words, Joshua, Jeshua, and Yeshua, there are some significant similarities, the first being that they are all connected with the idea of salvation and either directly or indirectly reference the Father as the source of that salvation. When comparing the original Hebrew spelling, it is also noteworthy that these three words are all slightly different arrangements of the same five Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Wa, Shin, and Ein. Thus, they really all do seem to be variations on a common theme, and while it might well be an oversimplification, it appears that these would be comparable to similar variations of names in English. For example, Jonathan Jr., which references a father. Jonathan, which is the full spelling of the name, and John, which is a shortened form. All of these names are variations used to refer to the same person. So how did the name Jesus derive from one of these Hebrew variations? Etymology.com has the following entry for Jesus, personal name of the Christian Savior, late 12th century. It is the Greek form of Joshua, used variously in translations of the Bible, from late Latin Iesus, properly pronounced as three syllables, from Greek Iesus, which is an attempt to render into Greek the Aramaic or Semitic proper name Jeshua, Hebrew Yeshua or Yoshua, Ja is salvation. This was a common Jewish personal name during the Hellenizing period. It is the latter form of Hebrew Yehoshua. In fact, archaeologists in Israel have actually found the name Yeshua carved into 71 burial caves and 30 ossuary boxes, all dating from the time the historical Jesus would have been alive. 
Thus, the name used in most Bible translations today is an English adaptation of a Latin transliteration of a Greek transliteration of an Aramaic version of an originally Hebrew name. And so, it is generally agreed by most Bible scholars that the name Jesus originated in more or less the following way. Much of the New Testament was originally written in Greek, which not only uses an entirely different alphabet than Hebrew, but also lacks several of the letter sounds. Beginning with Yeshua, the latter form of the Hebrew Yehoshua, the letter A was dropped from the end since the Greek language does not have any equivalent for the Hebrew letter Ein. The New Testament authors then decided to replace the SH in Yeshua for SO, which creates the Greek S sound, since there was no equivalent letter for the Hebrew letter Shin. The Ye sound at the beginning of Yeshua was replaced with the Greek IE, which is essentially an equivalent sound. A final S was then added as a nominative case ending, indicating it as a masculine name in the Greek language. Thus, Iesus became the Greek transliteration. When the Bible was translated into Latin from Greek, the translators dropped the O and rendered the name Iesus. This is how it appeared in the original 1611 King James Bible. It wasn't until 1524 that the letter J was added to the English alphabet and began to replace or to be used interchangeably with many instances of the letter I. The final modernized version of the name Jesus first appeared in 1560 in the Geneva Bible. Even this name has its variations. What was originally pronounced Iesus in the Greek is now commonly said as Jesus in modern English or Jesus in Spanish. However, when investigating the name Jesus, it won't take long to come across those claiming that it actually means Hail Zeus. Granted, Zeus was a Greek god, and the original Greek pronunciation does sound like it mentions Zeus. However, this assertion is easily dismissed when one realizes that the word Zeus itself is an English transliteration of a Greek word. And when comparing the name Jesus in Greek to the words Hail Zeus in Greek, one can clearly see they bear no resemblance whatsoever. This can be easily confirmed by any number of online translators, but for the sake of argument, here is a screenshot from wordhippo.com confirming the fact. For over 450 years, the word Jesus has been cherished and adored as the name of our Savior and Messiah. For centuries, countless multitudes of people across the world have come to faith under the name of Jesus. Millions of people continue to personally cry out and are delivered from evil by the name of Jesus. There is absolutely still power found in the name of Jesus. The intention of this video is not to dethrone the name of Jesus, but to simply reveal the history behind the name. Because it is an undeniable fact that when our Messiah was physically here on earth, he was certainly not addressed by the name Jesus. He would have more than likely been called by some variation of Yeshua, a name which literally means salvation. And there are a vast and growing number of believers that have found their relationship with the Savior strengthened in referring to him by his original Hebrew name. So no matter what name you personally decide to use for our Savior, it is critical that we all recognize that these are all relevant names for the Messiah. It is far more important that we be unified in our common faith in the Messiah rather than debating precise pronunciations. Just before he was betrayed and crucified, Yeshua made this final request of the Father. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. It is an incredible privilege to be able to call our Heavenly Father by name and to recognize his name when reading the Bible. 
For many, it is also fascinating to learn about and begin to use the Messiah's original Hebrew name. These are the two most important names in history, and studying the depth and significance behind them is a lifetime well spent.